<coughs> Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Dear Lord, we thank you for your presence in our lives. We thank you so much that we come before you and are just able to love you and be filled by your spirit, know your intimacy. Lord, it's the ecstasy that we have from walking with you, the fellowship with you, the communion with you that we all desire. Lord, we desire to draw near to God. We desire to draw near to you. And Lord, I thank you today that you teach us how to do that, how to come closer, how to be more intimate. Lord, how to fellowship in your perfect will and Lord, your purpose for our lives and Lord, with your spirit. Thank you, Lord, for filling us this morning with your Holy Spirit. Anoint my lips to speak for you, Lord, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let every word be yours, Lord. Speak to your people as you desire to have them to hear. And Lord, I thank you that they have open ears, spiritual ears, and they have spiritual eyes, and they can see and understand and hear the things that you desire for them to know. And Lord, we thank you that you'll continue to do the good work you began in us, and Lord, that you'll complete that work. And I thank you, Lord, that we'll do everything in our strength to make our lives open and free for you to use. And we'll give you all glory and power and honor, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's go in our Bibles this morning to the book of 1 Corinthians in chapter number 2. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians in chapter number 2. Last week I started talking to you and ministering to you on uh, a subject that, uh, you know, it's very hard for us, I guess, you know, to have a reality of some things. I was brought up Baptist, and I love the Baptist. You know, when I was being brought up, I was brought up in the Baptist church, and, I, you know, all my family, as I've told you before, was Baptist. Uh, all of my relatives were Baptist. All of my friends were Baptist. All of their families were Baptist. Everybody I knew was Baptist. Now, Baptists have a love for God, and... Uh, but when it comes to spiritual, Baptists kind of cut it off. You know, as I was uh, growing up and I became a Christian and turned my life over to the Lord, I grew up in church, but I ne didn't turn my life over to the Lord till I was 18 years old on my 18th birthday. But I loved the Baptists, and we had great fellowships. How many of you like fellowships? Baptists know how to fellowship. They know how to fellowship. You know, they, they put on some good eats and uh, have a good time, and that's okay because we all need fellowship, don't we? But when it came to certain things like talking about spiritual things like they were real, all of a sudden it's like, let's put the brakes on. Let's don't really talk about the devil like he's really real. Let's don't talk about demons. Let's don't talk about all that spiritual stuff because if we get into that, that's a little bit, you know, too far out there. Now, as a believer, I kind of had a different reality or a different idea of what being a Christian was, and I wanted to know about a lot of things spiritual, but my pastor, he had been a minister for 50 years, a Baptist preacher, but brother, you couldn't talk to him about spiritual because he didn't have a reality of spiritual. Now, I hate to say that, and I don't say, you know, he was, a, he was a Christian man. But I say this, he was a carnal Christian man. He was a carnal Christian man. Look here in this passage of Scripture here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 14. But the natural man does not receive the things that be of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually what? Discerned. They are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things. What judging, what kind of spiritual, he, the man who's spiritual, he judges all things. What kind of things does a spiritual man judge? Spiritual things. 
Now notice what he says about a spiritual man. He judges all things, but he himself is rightly judged by no one. When you walk in the spirit and you walk in spiritual things and the reality of spiritual things, Peter put it this way. He said, they're going to think you're queer. The world especially is going to think you're a weirdo because it's like, uh, you know, we're walking, woo-woo, you know. We're out there in la-la land. Ooh. I have, I've even had Christian friends, April will tell you. I told them there's a, there's a demonic spirit right at a certain spot, and they turned to April and went, mm, they looked at April like, mm. And this was a spiritual Christian. They didn't know there was a demon there. I recognized it immediately. But they didn't discern it. They didn't have the reality of it. Well, it showed itself violently, violently. Now, I saw the demon's face. I discerned him, and I, I have, like I said, certain gifts in my life. I didn't put them there. God put them there. And the Bible says we all have different gifts varying according to, you know, the, the different purposes that God puts in our life and why he gives us those gifts. He's the one who chose what he purposed us for and what he desires us to do. And those gifts will go along with our calling. They are what kind of gifts are they? Can anybody tell me? Spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts. They're not carnal gifts. They're not natural gifts. They are spiritual gifts. The Bible says that some men have the gifts of healings. You know, there's all type of different men in this world, and as I've come up through Christianity, they had the spiritual gift of healing. They could lay hands on people, and those people would be delivered from sickness. Now, you know, that wasn't make-believe. They weren't a doctor. They were just like Jesus. Jesus spat on the ground, made dirt, put it in the blind man's eyes, told him to go wash it out. When he did, he came seeing. You see, that's a spiritual gift. Jesus had them all. He had them all. And he, had all, he was the body of Christ singularly in person. He had all the gifts. He had all the all the. Uh, Authorities. He had all the, the callings that are in the Bible. They were all wrapped up in Jesus. And that's why no one can necessarily be everything Jesus would ever be. But when he went up and the Bible says he ascended on high, he gave gifts unto men. He appointed certain men for certain callings, certain positions. And he gave them the spiritual gifts to go along with that calling. Now Paul's a spiritual man. How many of you know that? And Paul said, I, he, he, he said these words, I come behind no apostle. Think about that. Paul boldly said, when it comes to knowing the Lord and walking with the Lord, I come behind no apostle. He didn't walk with Jesus. There were 12 men who did that were chosen by Jesus. Paul wasn't one of them. But yet Peter said about Paul, Paul has spiritual understanding that we don't. Now think about that. How did Paul get that spiritual understanding? He got it through the Spirit. He got it by walking in the Spirit. After he was called, Paul said he went for 14 years out into the wilderness, and God gave him, gave him the message that he was supposed to bring back to the church. He said, I was you know, caught up in the third heavens. He said, I don't even know whether it was in my body or out of my body, but I, I saw and heard unspeakable things that are impossible for me to explain. Now, if you go see something that no one's ever seen before and you have a reality of that that other people do not have and you come back and you try to explain those things, Paul said, he said, I don't preach and teach to you with earthly men's words. He said, I, I minister to you not in eloquence of speech or I'm not a great speaker. Paul said, you know, he called himself basically a, a bumbling speaker. He said, I'm not like Apollos who comes with you to you with eloquent words and eloquent speech. You know, how many people, you know, you like that kind of person? You know, because they could smooth talker. They're a smooth talker. We got politicians like that. We got preachers like that. They smooth talkers. But they don't know the Lord. 
They don't know the Lord. Paul knew the Lord, and he knew him intimately. Peter said, even more intimate than us. He talks about things that are hard for us to understand. Think about that. How do you have that reality? And Paul said, when I come preaching to you, I don't come preaching to you with the wisdom of man's words. I come speaking to you with the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Spirit comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. I'm not comparing these things. I'm not here to compare to you or teach you natural men's wisdom. I'm here to teach you spiritual men's wisdom. Now, there's a spiritual world, and listen to me, people. It is more real than the one you're sitting in right now, that your body's sitting in. There are demons all around. There are angels all around. You live in that world. The Bible says of your spirit. They said, show us the kingdom, show us the kingdom. Jesus said, you know, the, the kingdom of God doesn't come with outward appearance. He said, the kingdom of God is within you. This is where the kingdom of God is. I live and your spirit lives in the same realm God does. Your spirit lives in the kingdom of God. Right now in that kingdom, you are seated in Christ Jesus in heavenly places, far above all principalities and powers and rulers and mice and dominions, and God has given you authority and placed under your feet all power and authority. Now, a lot of us are not going to know even when Satan is doing something. Because, first of all, we don't talk about him. We want to play like he's not real. <laughs> we want to think he's not real. But you've never actually had to totally deal with him. And if you have, you'll know how real he is. And it can be pretty, it can, it's, it's not, I wasn't fearful, never have been fearful of the devil. I didn't have a fear of him. April would tell you that. You know, when we got married, she, she would, uh, we might be flipping through the channels looking for something, and it'd be some scary show. And I'd look at the scary show, and I'd go, uh, my mind's thinking, well, what a joke. Because in the scary shows, the devil is always more powerful than God. He's super powerful. And the, and the devil and, and God's people are always like, oh. Truth is, I'd look at it and say, how stupid. How stupid. April would get, oh, she gets scared. Turn it, turn it, turn it. I'd say, I don't want to watch it anyway. But she's like, get off of there, get it off of there. But she didn't want to see it. And I understand that. It's better not to expose yourself to stuff that you don't know. You know what the Bible says that when Paul cast out the devils out of the, out of the man, uh, they went away screaming, and then these other bozos decide they're going to do the same thing. Only problem is, they went and tried to cast the devils out of this man, and he turned on them and ripped their clothes off and would have killed them. They took off running. And they, this is what the demon said to them. He said, we cast you out in the name of Jesus who Paul preaches. The only problem is they didn't know Jesus who Paul preached. They didn't have the reality of Jesus in their heart or their life, but they went out and thought they could do the same thing that Paul was doing, and they went out there, and the Bible says this, that the demons would have killed them. Except they ran. They took off running naked. Now you go mess with the devil and you play around with the devil. He's not a make-believe being. He's a real being. And the Bible says that they fled for their lives and with, just with their lives. That's all they got. And they said, we cast you out in the name of Jesus who Paul preaches. And the demons made a response. Jesus we know and Paul we know. <laughs> We don't know who you are. And they jumped on them and like to kill them. Now you see the difference was Jesus we know, and guess what? Paul knew who he was in, and he knew what kind of authority and power he had. And the demons knew that too. Now you say, well, that stuff, it just ain't real. Well, it's not real to a natural-minded man. Now, I'm talking to Christians. This passage, to a lot of degree, is talking about an unbeliever. He doesn't have a, a spiritual mind. He has a natural mind. And because he has a natural mind, he doesn't have the reality of spiritual things. Or, listen again, people, he does not have spiritual discernment. 
Discernment means that you have a reality of what's there. You have a reality of what's around you spiritually. And because if you're not a spiritual man or a spiritual woman, you will not have that reality. Now, as a Christian, when you got saved, you automatically were born again, and your spirit became a child of the living God. Now you will have realities about spiritual things you did not have before. Amen? Because what happened is when you, became, you were born again, the Bible says that you were of the devil, you were living of the devil, you, you followed the devil's lust and desires, and then what happened is when you got saved, the Bible says your eyes were what? Open. Your spiritual eyes were open, and for the first time in your life you said, hey, God's real. Hey, the spirit realm is real. You know, all of a sudden you have a reality of something you didn't have before because now you became a child of God and you were enlightened. Your eyes were illuminated. And now spiritually you began to discern things. Now the sad thing about Christians, and, and I won't turn over there, but in Hebrews 5 it talks about being a Christian. And because as a Christian you stay carnal and you live your life on such a carnal level, and because of that, the Bible says you don't grow up into Christ and become, you know, mature into Christ. You stay on a carnal level and you think about things still. Paul told the Corinthians church one chapter over here. Matter of fact, you can just look right down. Look at verse chapter 3 and verse number 1. <clears throat> he said, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you to spiritual people, but only as to carnal people. Who's he talking to? He's talking to Christians. I could not speak to you like I, you were spiritual. That's a shame, isn't it? <laughs> That's a shame that as a Christian, and this is the way it was in the Baptist church, and again, I love the Baptist church. I see, uh, you know, Bill Graham and all them going out and doing tremendous things to help all these people with a hurricane, and if they weren't there doing that, those people would be on their own. That's a blessing. That's a gift from God. And there, I'm not saying all Baptist people are not spiritual. There, I've met a, quite a number of Baptist people who are truly spiritual, but not totally spiritual, because if you get a little too spiritual, they start going, okay, that's enough. When I was in Bible college, and the friends of mine that I was going to school with, and when I said, you know, I'm stepping out further, I'm not going by all this, I'm... And I start talking about all these spiritual things and casting out devils and things of this sort. Can anybody here as a Christian look in the Bible and see what did Jesus do? What did the apostles do? What did the early believers do? They cast out what? Devils. They cast them out. Now, when I was a Baptist, they say, you know, what does Mark 16 tell us? It says, you know, these signs shall follow those that what? believe said they will speak in tongues they will heal the sick they'll speak in tongues they'll cast out devils now you see in a lot of uh, the baptist claim those scriptures weren't in the original context those were added later <laughs> well was jesus casting out devils added later was all the disciples casting out devils was that added later no it was a reality they cast out devils. And see, my friends would tell me, all of that stuff's gone. It's done away with. Jesus done away with all that. I said, all the devils are gone? All the demons are gone? Where'd they go? Where they went? You know what I'm saying? It just wasn't a reality to them. They had no reality of it. And guess what? They didn't want any reality of it. Because they wanted to stay carnal. They wanted to live just like they were living, worldly, carnal, fleshly, and a mind. See, that's one good thing. As a Christian, you're a Christian. And they were Christians. They were my friends. I loved them. But they had a mentality that was earthly. They had a mentality that was worldly. It was all about this world. It was all about the things in this world. And it was still all about the natural. Well, I didn't have that mentality. Nor did I want that mentality. I wanted to grow up in Christ, and I wanted to become a spiritual man in Christ Jesus. 
So I started seeking God. First thing I had to learn, there's only one who can reveal spiritual things. And it's not a man. He's not a man. He's the Spirit of God. And I have an unction, the Bible says, from the Holy One, from the One who lives in me, from the Holy Spirit. And he says, I can know all things because in him there is no lie. And I've told you this before. There are plenty of deceivers in this world. And deceivers are going to lie to you. And they're going to tell you one thing. This is why God made a way to where no one can come between you and him. No man, I don't stand behind any man or look at any man or say I need to go through that man to get to God. Nor do I have to have that man tell me what God wants because God can tell me himself. I'm his child. He can tell me himself what he wants and what he desires because I am his child. The Bible says Jesus said this, my sheep do what? They hear my voice, they know my voice, and they follow my voice. Now, if you're a child of God, you should be hearing his voice. You should recognize his voice, and you should follow his voice. Because he speaks to you the same way he speaks to me and the same way he speaks to every single one of his children. The difference is... You have to come to walk with him to where you begin to recognize his voice and distinguish his voice and then know his voice and follow his voice. I had to learn a lot of things about walking with God. All of us do. But last week I began to talk to you about the fact that there is a devil. And who is he? Peter said this. He said, be sober, be alert for your adversary." Are your enemy the devil? Now, do you think about things like this? You live in a spiritual world as a Christian. And in that world, you have an enemy. You have an adversary. And Peter warned you. Now, would Peter go around saying, oh, it's no really big deal. We're just, we're just talking about something that ain't really real. No. He knew because, I, as I told you last week, he had a good go-round with him. And he learned his lesson the hard way. Be sober. Be alert. Because you have an adversary, the devil, who is roaming about, seeking whom he may devour. Therefore, resist him steadfast in faith. Steadfast in faith. In this spiritual world I live in, there are demons who are after me. You know, but when I was born... I grew up in a home where the devil ruled. Now, how do I know that? <laughs> because I experienced it. As a young boy, I experienced demonic things. And I didn't go looking for that. It was just there. Why was it there? Because Satan had a stronghold on my dad. My dad was tremendously fearful. He was tremendously fearful. And I could go, and I've told you things about before, how he got that way, the way he grew up, what he was exposed to, things that caused him to fear. And anytime people fear something and they fear it pretty strong, that fear is going to prevail. It prevailed over our house, over our home. Because that fear is, is paralyzing. And that controls. Fear controls. But that didn't come from a human. That came from a spirit. And when the Bible says, uh, you know, our weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of what? Strongholds. Everybody, I would almost bet everybody in this room in your life grew up with something that became a stronghold in your life. Well, it didn't get there by accident. There was a force spiritually working to bring you to that place. Now, as a, as a young man, when I became a Christian, I had to decide, am I going to live like my daddy? <laughs> 
Well, I became a Christian. I loved my daddy. But I understood. I began to realize and understand my daddy was like he was because there are spiritual things here operating in this home, and it's a stronghold. It went out over my brother and my sisters. It went out over my mom. It, went, it was just controlling. It was fear. It was just fear, fear, fear. And, and when my daddy got in a position where he lost control or he could not control a situation, it really got bad because that brought such fear on him that he could not control the situation that he would take it out on everybody else around him, meaning those that were closest to him, because he was tormented. Now, I've, I, had to sp I spent time with my daddy before, years and years before he died, and we slowly worked on that for him to understand what, it, what he's going through and why he's going through it. But you know, he was bound by that his whole life. It was horrible. But not only was he bound by it, it spread out. And you see what happens in every family? I've told you this. I've dealt with families in this parish that with incest. <coughs> incest in their family is rampant. It's all throughout the family. Why is that? That's demonic. It started back generations earlier, and it was carried through time. And as it was carried through time, it spread through the whole family. And it became rampant. Now, a lot of those people and that, those families I, had to, I dealt with, I, I talked to them, I prayed for them, they were delivered. They were delivered. They had to get delivered. That was something demonically powerful over their life. Do you think any... Mass murderer, do you think any ser serial killer or serial rapist or anything like this got to be that way just by accident? No, there were spiritual forces of evil that were working on their life from the time they were little. And that they slowly gave in to that and they became bound by that and that spiritual force took them over. You say, that's not real, Brother David. You'll find out one day how real it all is. Because one day, your body is going to cease to exist. And your physical eyes are going to close for the last time. And in that moment, and at that second, your spiritual eyes are going to open. And for the first time, for a lot of people, and I'm even talking about Christian people, for the first time in their life, they're going to understand the reality of what was around them their whole life. And they had no discernment of it. Last week, I went and talked to a 10-year-old boy. And I'd been hearing a few things about some things he had gotten exposed to. <clears throat> and when I heard that, I said, not good. Not good. He got exposed to it because his mother and his father are separated. And when he goes to stay with his father, he gets one thing, exposed to one thing. When he stays with his mother, he gets the Christian influence. But while he's at his dad's, he's getting exposed to some things demonic. And so they told me about it, and I began to pray about it. I told you last week, every time I start to talk about Satan or I talk about the devil or anything to do with that, I never fail. I'm going to have to deal with something. It's either in my life or it's somebody else's life, but it's just like he rises up. And sure enough, you know, they, they call. And, and what he started happening in his life is he started seeing demonic spirits. And he told his mama he was seeing de demons. He said, they sit in, near my desk in my room. I saw them in the hallway. I saw them in the window. And his parents just, these are Christians, just kind of brush it off. And he's just wanting attention. I told him, no, he's not wanting attention. He opened a door. A door was open. And now that door has to be closed or he's going to have trouble and you're going to have trouble. This has, to, this has to stop. It has to be shut down. 
And so they brought him to me. I talked to him. I said, I said son, I'm going to talk to you like I don't even talk to adults. And I'm going to tell you some things. I said, I, we're sit, sitting in the house, and I said, look out that window right there. I said, you're in, we're in a what? He said, a house. I said, you see that window? He said, you're looking out that window. I said, son, your body, the Bible says, is the house God lives in. Now, he's a Christian boy. He's received Christ. He's been baptized. I said, this is, this is God's house. And I said, you see these right here? That's the windows. And these right here? <laughs> That's the things that can hear. And what you're hearing and what you're seeing and what you're focusing on, that's going to get in here. I said, the Bible, I told him the same thing I told y'all last week. Satan's a roaring lion. I said, if you're looking out that window right there and you're looking through that door, and you would see a lion out there prancing back and forth, looking at you, wanting to eat you. <laughs> I said, would you go open that door? Would you go unlatch that and open that door and let that lion come in? He said, no. I said, well, you're letting him in. You're letting the lion in. And you're letting him in here. And it's because of what you're looking at and what you're listening to and what you're seeing. And as you look at those things and you opening yourself up, I said, when you go fishing, I said, what do you use? You have, he says, mm. I said, do you have a fishing pole? I said, what you put on the fishing pole? What you put on the end of the line? He said, bait. I said, mm -hmm. I said, when you go and you want to catch something, you bait him. I said, well, that's what, that's what the devil is doing to you right now. He's throwing you some bait. Only problem is, just like that fish, there's a hook on that with that bait. And when you light into it, because it's enticing, you want it, you desire it, you keep focusing on it, he's going to hook you. And once he hooks you, he's pulling you in. And you're captured. And at that point, I said, he moved into your house. Now he's going to live in your house. You have to decide whether you're going to let him in or you're going to keep him out. I said, nobody can decide. I said, that's why I'm talking to you like an adult. I'm not talking to you. I wish I could just talk to you like your child. But this is not child. This is not about being a child right now. This is something very serious. And I said, you are the only one who can shut that door. You're the only one that can shut him out. Nobody can shut him out for you. And this is the way the devil is. It doesn't matter how little you are. You were exposed to the devil from the time you were born. And you're going to be exposed to him to the time you die. As long as you're in this world, he's in this world. And what I told you last week, he wants to have you. That's what he told Peter. Jesus told Peter, Satan desireth to have you. He wants you. I told you he got, he, he got Judas. He wanted Peter because he wants God's children. And when we say the Lord told us how to pray, we said last week, he said, you know, don't lead us, Father, into temptation, but deliver us from evil. There's evil that we all have to be delivered from. And so I'm talking to you straightforward again, Christian, today, just like I did last week. You are God's child. You're his people. Satan wants you. You said, I got saved. Sure you did, and you are. But you have to know there's someone fishing for you. There's someone who wants you, someone who desires to have you, Peter clearly told you he's your adversary, he is your enemy. Now, if you say, uh, when I have the Lord, we say the Lord is my fortress. He's my rock, he's my high tower. What is a fortress for? Protection. From what? That's right, it's the enemy. The 
If you build a fort, there's an enemy coming. There's an enemy coming. And that enemy is coming after you. I need a fortress. I need a protection. Christ is my rock. He's my fortress. He's my protection. Now, life and death, we're talking about spiritual life and death. If we're looking at the world today, we are looking at a devil and a demonic world, and this is what the Bible says. There was war in the heavens, and Michael and his angels fought against Satan and his angels. How many of you know, why is there war on earth? Why is there war on earth? Because there's war in heaven. There's always war in heaven. When, when Daniel prayed, the Bible says that you know immediately from the very first day he prayed the bible says that that uh you know the angel came and started to come and then the bible says that he was res resisted from answering daniel's prayer daniel prayed 21 days he said from the day thou was first you first started to pray i was dispatched but i've had to wrestle with the devil all the way here to get you your answer. See, everything that's going on in your life, people, will first start in your spiritual life. What goes on in your physical life, listen to me, no matter what it is, will begin in the spiritual realm. And it will move into this realm. And there's only one who has power over that realm, and he lives in you. He's your Savior. He's your Lord. Let's take a look real quick over in 1 Corinthians in chapter number, let's see, verse, chapter number 10, and we'll start with verse number 1. Now, I didn't know we were going to have communion today, and I didn't know Brother Sid walked up to me and said, Lord, I said, I know that this is something that you want the body to hear. And I know there'll, there'll be people who need to make a decision. And, I, and the message that God was putting on me had to do with communion. And Brother Sid came and said, and I said, Lord, I know you want an altar call. Show me how you want it. Brother Sid came and said, we're going to do communion today, but we're going to do it at the end. So I want you to hear the message, and I want you to understand what God's trying to tell you. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware, or you could say the word ignorant. See, I would not have you ignorant. Paul started a lot of his preaching in the Bible that way. I would not have you ignorant. Now, ignorant, what is ignorance? Ignorance is you don't know any better. You don't know any better. You don't, you don't understand something. My daddy used to tell me, I was, a number of times he would tell me, and he was right. He said, boy, you stupid. He would tell it to me just like that. Boy, you stupid. And I'd think, hmm. But he's, he'd explain it. If you didn't know any better, boy, I wouldn't, I wouldn't whip you. But I done told you three or four times already. You're not ignorant no more. You done been warned over and over and over again. My daddy was a good man. I'm not telling you he was a bad man. My daddy, I love my daddy. He was a good man. He'd give people the shirt off his back. But he had a problem. <laughs> but he didn't know what his problem was. But he would tell me, I'd say, Daddy, uh, Sam's daddy lets him do that. <laughs> he said, if Sam goes, jumps off a cliff, are you going to go jump off with him? He said, that's stupid, boy. Stupid. And he's right. Because ignorance when I don't know any better. Stupid's when I know better and I keep on doing it. That's stupid. So, you see, that's what I was. Stupid. <laughs> what was going to do? What was going to happen? I was going to get hurt. I was going to get harmed. 
Why? Because I'm ignorant? No, because I'm stupid. I'm doing things I know better. Now listen, Paul says, I would not have you to be ignorant or unaware that, listen, all of your fathers were under the cloud. They all passed through the sea. Your fathers, who are our fathers? Well, this is why they're being persecuted today. Who's our spiritual fathers? Israel. Israel's our spiritual father. They're where we all came from. They're the reason we're all here to sitting here today as Christians. Without them, we would not be here. We would not be saved. We would not have had Christ. Christ would have never came into the world. There would not have been an avenue for him. It was all the work of God through a certain people, a small number of people. They were called God's people. God's people. And they are under tremendous attack. Why are they under attack? Because just like the book of Revelation said, and, you know, the devil and his angels, they, they go to make war upon the woman who brought forth the man-child. Satan hates the, the Jewish nation like you wouldn't believe. He despises them. You wonder how there's such a hatred all over the world for the Jews? It's spiritual. It comes from the devil and the demons, and they hate the Jews, and they want to destroy them. But here we see they are our fathers. He says, and we were all, now he's talking to Christians, and these Corinthians were not Jews. They were Gentiles. So he's telling them, even though they were Gentiles, that the Jews were their spiritual fathers. He said, they all passed under the cloud, and they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now, what's a cloud? What was a cloud for in the wilderness? It was a covering. You know, all of us have fathers or had fathers, hopefully. And some didn't. And if you had some, some were really bad. And I'm sorry for that. But a father... Even a spiritual father, the Bible says God gives you spiritual fathers, your shepherds, your elders. What are they? They're a protection. They're a protection over you. They've been given wisdom, authority by God over you. Just like you had a father over you. Uh, and as you were growing up, that father, if he's a good father, he was protecting you from evil things. He was making sure your needs were provided for. He was, you know, loving you. He was disciplining you when you needed. He was correcting you because you were under his umbrella. My dad always used to put it, as long as you live under my roof, you go by my rules. That was his rules. <laughs> and it's true because he was, it was his roof. It was his house. It was his money that was feeding me. It was his time. It was his effort. It was all those things that he did to take care of us and provide for us and watch out for us. And he did that. He did all those things. But that was a protection for me. If I would have grown up the way some of my friends grew up, whose fathers could care less about them, I had cousins, first cousins, that they grew up without any kind of father over their life. Their fathers left them, left their mothers. I have two first cousins in, in the same family whose fathers left them and just left them. Left them for other women. Ran out on them. Three boys in both cases. Three boys with no fathers. <laughs> and when they would come, I would go, boy, we're going to be in trouble. Because I knew they were always wanting trouble. They were wanting to do something they shouldn't be doing. And I knew they were going to want to drag us into that. You know, like BB gun wars. You know, things like that. Or, you know, it's all kinds of stuff. They, they, they knew it all. They do it all. But I want to tell you what, when they came to our house, I saw my daddy tear all their behinds up, one after another, along with me and my brother. He tore us all up. And, brother, when I say tore you up, everybody could not sit down. You know those boys? You know what they told me? They love my daddy. They respected him. He put the fear in them. But the one thing they knew is that he loved me. 
them. Or he wouldn't have done that. He didn't hate them. He loved them. Spare the rod, do what? They were spoiled. They didn't get what we got. We had a protective covering. And that protective covering kept me out of a lot, a lot of troubles in my life. Now, you see, this is our father. But the Bible tells us about them. They passed through, the Bible says, the wilderness, all of them. Notice he keeps saying all. Five times he says all. All our fathers, all passed through the sea. All were baptized in Moses and the cloud. All ate the same spiritual food. All drank the same spiritual drink. Notice who? how many? All of them. All of them. Now, people, you're a Christian. You're passing through the wilderness. This isn't the promised land. You're on your way to the promised land. But during the promised land, reaching the promised land, you've got to pass through this fiery, you know, desert. The Bible says fiery serpents. It's got fiery serpents and scorpions. It's little food. It's little water. It's a desert. You ever feel like you're living in a desert, people? Brother David does. <laughs> it's a struggle, like I told you last week. It's a struggle. You know, I was just, me and April was just struggling to say, oh, I got $10,000 worth of tires I need to put on my truck. So April and I work, and we work, we work. I said, babe, I think we got enough. We work like dogs. Daylight to dark. Before daylight, way after dark. Oh, we got enough now to put them tires on the truck. <coughs> no. What's them trailer? What's them tires doing back there on that trailer? Looks like they're bouncing everywhere. Couldn't quite tell, so when we got home this weekend, I told April, okay, take it, and I'm going to follow you in the pickup truck and get out there on the interstate. We get out there on the interstate, run down the road, and the back wheels on the trailer are doing it. Boom, 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 boom. All my bushings in my trailer are gone. That's not a little job. That's probably a two to three day job, and I got $8,000 worth of work lined up this week. Guess where it all goes? Take a debt, give all that back, put it in the shop, spend money. It's a struggle. It's every day. You know what? I could murmur and complain, and I do a little bit. <laughs> I'm tired, Lord. I'm tired. But you know what? I have never had my Lord fail to meet my needs. Not once. I told you, we, we run a business that needs so much money, huh, Brother RJ? Needs so much money to keep that thing going. And that's just one. But then you know what? We've gotten down. We have four different accounts, one for, one for, for the trucking, one for the expense account. We don't keep all our money in one because people rob it. We've already had $3,000 robbed. And, you know, we have one personal, and we have another little farm account, we call it. And I think all together we had about, what, $84 in all four of them put together? $84. You know how much money you can spend in just one second on a, on a truck? Do I lose any sleep over it? No, I do because I'm tired. <laughs> I get up and run harder. But I still make it. We always make it. And you know what? My Lord loves me. He cares deeply for me. It don't matter to me. Just as long as he, I'm a, I make it. That's all that matters. But here we have all these people. Notice what the Bible says about them. They all ate of the same thing. They all drank of the same thing. And the Bible says, look what he says. They ate, they were all baptized under Moses and in the cloud and in the sea. See that cloud covered them? And they passed through the sea, they were all baptized into Moses. Same way we all are under the covering of Christ, we were all baptized into Christ. We all drank the same spiritual food. I hope you're, I mean, eat the same spiritual food. I hope you're eating some now. And we all drink the same spiritual drink, which is, he said, they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. 
So do all these people know Christ or they know God? Are they his people? Yes, they are. But the Bible says here, but with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Now, Christian, listen to me. I know you're getting a little tired. We should not lust after evil things. When Christ saved me, like I told you last week, he delivered me. He delivered me from the powers of darkness. That is a real thing. That's not a make-believe thing. He, the Bible says he translated you out of the kingdom of darkness and over into the kingdom of his dear son, into the kingdom of light. So now the Bible says you're no longer of the darkness, but you are of the light. Now you're his child. You were the devil's child. Now you're his child. Spiritually, that's what he did for you. And when he did that, you began to commune with him. You began to drink of Christ, and you began to eat from Christ. You, you ate the bread from heaven. You're eating the bread from heaven that he brought down to you. And you eat of Christ, and we drink of Christ. We take communion with Christ. We walk with Christ. We fellowship with Christ. And at the same time, we have to have a reality that just because we came out of darkness does not mean that that darkness and evil cannot still come back or try to reach to you and take you back. Because that same devil, he wants you more now. He used to have you, now he wants you back. What does he say here? He said, they were given to us as examples for the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Now, what happens? The Bible tells us this, and I told you this last week. The Bible says, for us, James says it this way, Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Now, he, before that, he said these words. He said, you know, if you're sin, he said, sin's going to come. Because what does the devil do with sin? What's sin for? Sin is for a purpose from the devil. And he's not playing a game. Just like this little, little boy I talked to last week. I told him he's not playing a game. He's for real. You're seeing things. His parents said, I, he, he's just wanting attention. I said, no, ma'am. He's not just wanting attention. He would not have told you what he told you for attention. <laughs> he would not come up with that. He's seeing things. And he's seeing them because what's happening is a door's been opened to him. And just like I told him, there's a, there's a fishing expedition going on. Now, the Bible says, don't say when I'm being tempted... Listen to me, all people are tempted, even Christ himself, listen, Christ himself was subject to the same temptations that you and I are. You, oh, but they didn't have no power. Yes, they did. He sweat great drops of blood resisting it. There's temptation, and Christ had the same temptations you and I do, probably even more so and more powerful than anything you and I would ever experience. But the Bible says he was without sin. He never gave in to the temptation. The Bible says it is not a sin, people, to be tempted. You're in the world. The devil is here. You cannot stop the devil from tempting you. If you have a problem, like I said, with alcoholism, you're not going to want to go to the bar, are you? If you go to the bar, guess what's going to happen? The temptation is going to grow a thousand times more stronger. That is not resisting the devil. That is not submitting to God. If I'm, if I'm submitting to God and I want the devil out of my life, I'm not going to go and submit to the devil and do something that I know is going to be harmful to me. I'm not going to take something, if there's a problem in my life, whatever it is, I'm not going to open myself up to that. If I'm doing that, there's a reason. The devil is going to come and tempt me. And as long as I'm in this world, I'm subject to the same temptations everybody else is. Only problem, there are certain things in every one of our lives 
that are more tempting to us than other things are. You want to judge your brother because they have this problem in their life. But you have this problem. That problem is a stronghold in their life. This problem is a stronghold in yours. It's not a sin, number one either, to even have a stronghold in your life. The Bible says tearing down strongholds. Tear them down. The weapons of your warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. I had a stronghold in my life, and I had to tear it down. I had to tear it down. If you don't tear it down, it's going to destroy you. It's going to put you in bondage. It's going to put you in chains. And your whole life, you're going to be subject to the devil controlling you. And in whatever area of life that is, he's going to keep on controlling you. And he's going to keep on destroying you. And not only is he going to do that, he's going to take that sin and help destroy other people with it who you are exposed to. Now, you have to decide. I have to do what James says. He says, he says beware of the devil. Because he said, you're not being tempted. Don't say I'm being tempted. Every man's tempted. I'm not being tempted by God. I'm being tempted by the devil. And the Bible says when that temptation, you know, you know, conceives, when you give in to that temptation, what happens in your life? It brings forth sin. What does sin do with you and your relationship with God? It starts to push into that intimacy. James even went on to say, you adulterer and adulteresses. See, when you sin, if I went and committed adultery against my wife, I would be sinning against my wife. I would be breaking our trust. I would also very much interfere with our communion because now sin has come between me and her. Same way, no difference with the Lord. When you're enticed to sin, the devil has one purpose. He's throwing a bait out there to you. Something, the Bible says, don't say I'm being tempted of God, but I am enticed, the Bible says. James says you're enticed. Every man is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. The devil is coming to entice you. He's coming to take you away from God. He wants to separate you from God. The very first thing, Christian, that you have to realize when it comes to sinning and doing something that God has warned you about or told you to stay away from is that you are opening a door to the devil and you're inviting him into your life. You're inviting sin into your life. And what you do now is you become exposed to that sin. Now that sin begins to, to have power over you. You've given it power. You've allowed the devil to have power he did not have. But now that sin is going to, you're going to be ashamed of it. So that's going to immediately cause you to kind of push away from God. And you're going to feel guilty. And the Bible says your conscience is going to become condemned. And that should be what happens because that should be the natural response. If I had done something that, like that to my wife, I would very much be destroyed by it. It would break my conscience. It would destroy my conscience. And then I would be ashamed of it. I wouldn't want to approach her. I sure wouldn't want to tell her. And you see, that's what you do with God. And that's the whole purpose the devil's got it for, because he knows that sin is going to come between you and God. Now, God says when that happens, we all fail. Sometimes we fall short of the glory of God. But we don't start to make a practice of it, do we? We don't start practicing this sin in our life and giving in to it every time it turns around or every time it shows up. Now, I'm going to tell you this about the Lord when it comes to sin. The Lord's going to be a hundred times or even a thousand times more patient with a baby Christian or a young Christian as he is with an older Christian. Because he knows what you're ignorant of and he knows what you're not ignorant of. And so God's going to deal with you on a different level just like he's going to deal with a child on a different level than he does an adult. If you're an adult and you're doing these things, it gets a whole lot worse. And God's, you know, reaction to it is going to get worse. But here's the thing. That sin is now in your life, and it's causing a separation in your communion with God. It's causing you to push back from God because you're ashamed, and it's causing God to look and say, my child is disobeying me. He's rebelling. They're rebelling. How many of you ever had a child rebel against you? How does that make you feel? You told them something, 
Now, if your children have, and I'm pretty sure lots of people in here had the situation, they've got into a situation where their kids have got into something they shouldn't have got into, and that pulled them away from what? Pulls them away from your fellowship. They want to do what their friends are doing. They want to get involved in that, and they get involved in it, and after a while, they don't even talk to you, their, their parents anymore. I want nothing to do with their parents. Their friends are now their family. Same people that are participating in the sin. Because you see what happens now is the fellowship is broken. First thing that goes is the fellowship. And now that you're in this sin, it's breaking your fellowship with God. You're not drawing near to God. Notice what James said, you adulterers, you adulteresses. He said, you know, don't you know that being a friend with the world is making you an enemy with God? He said, submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. The devil will then flee from you. Draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. He'll come back. You're, it's not God who left anywhere. Are you understand that? It's you that left somewhere. And you let the devil between you and God. And he was just throwing out a little bait. And every time he throws out that little bait, it gets easier and easier. If you're not resisting, to keep taking that bait. And pretty soon, this is what the Bible warns. It says, after, when you first give in to the temptation, it brings forth sin in your life. <coughs> but when that becomes a practice and a continual practice, and it takes over your life and begins to destroy you, is God going to reject you? No, he's going to do everything. How many of you have ever seen a child get lost on drugs? I don't, I, every parent I've ever seen, They'll spend every last dollar they got. They'll do whatever they can. They'll, they'll, they'll go anywhere, do anything to get their child back. But if that child keeps on persisting and going away and doesn't want to come back, the parent sooner or later is forced to give up because there's no way they can get them back. They've tried everything they know. Father's the same way. Your heavenly Father's the same way. You're going to fall in this life. Spiritually, you're going to fail. The Bible says a man, a righteous man, will fall seven times, but the Lord will uphold him with the right hand of his righteousness. God knows you're working, you, you're seeking him, you're desiring to follow him, just like Peter, and he's going to restore you. But if you don't want God and you keep as a Christian going in a certain direction, the Bible says what's going to happen is that sin you're giving into is going to become full-blown. And the Bible says it will conceive. That means it takes you over. And it brings forth death. There's a spiritual death. Because now you've hardened your heart to God to the point that you can't come back. Basically, you don't want to come back. This is what's going to happen to Christians in the last days. There's going to be a great apostasy from the faith, a great falling away. Why does the Bible say that's going to happen? Because sin shall abound. It's going to be so easy to sin. How many of you know it's already easy to sin? See, homosexuality, that's not even a sin anymore. I listen to them on the news and stuff, and now there's a lot of homosexual People on Fox, gay and homosexual. But they all claim to be Christian. And I think, you know, I love them. I don't want them to perish. But that's a lie. That's a lie. They're not going to be saved. They can claim they, they're a Christian, but if you're living in sin, the Bible says, you know, you can't live in sin and then claim that you're right with God. I've had minister friends who've done that, and I was sent to rebuke them, and I did. And you see, it's not right. It's evil in God's eyes. God still loves them, but they, he didn't send me to destroy them. He sent me to tell them, get rid of it now, turn around. And several of them, is, I told them, your last warning. Spiritually, it's your last warning. you got to turn now. And it's time. It's time to put that away. They got to get a fear. If I went out and did things my daddy told me not to do, he, this is my daddy's words, don't ever let me catch you doing that. 
Don't ever let me catch you doing that. Brother, that sent a chill through my bones, Brother Tibby. And guess what? He didn't catch me. I might have still done it, but he didn't catch me. But I was sure scared as fire that he was going to catch me. Because I knew if he caught me, I was thinking, end of me, end of my life. Be the worst beating I ever got. My daddy, I told y'all this, he told, he said, I had to whip my brother Bill. He said, I probably whipped him a dozen times. He said, I, I whipped maybe your, your sister a couple of times, and the spoiled one that came along last. I used to tell Daddy, I said, she came along 10 years after all the rest of us. I told Daddy, she was the mistake. He said, no, she was the only one we planned. <laughs> I thought she was the mistake. We were the mistakes, you know. So, But he told me, he said, uh, he'd tell, it's, so he's telling my relatives, hey, Bubba, I had to give him a 1,000 whippings because I was stubborn. I wanted things my way. You know why? I was just like him. I was just like him, hard-headed and stubborn. But you know, the Lord had to break me of that. That's trouble. If, if I'm rebelling, first of all, I'm disrespecting my father. I'm telling him I don't care what he thinks. I don't care if it, he likes it or he don't like it. I don't care if it bothers him or it don't bother him. I'm doing what I want to do. And guess what? These people did just that. They did what they wanted to do. I'm going to close here, and, and I want to finish this real quick. Let Brother Sid have this. He said, now these things, verse 6, became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, that we do not become idolaters as some of them, as it is written, the people sat down, to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 fell. For let us, and nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by what? Serpent. You know what tempting Christ is? I told you the little story of the gazelle running up to the line and just taunting him. How many of us would be stupid enough to do that to Christ? You just taunt him. You're putting him to the test. See, I was, if I did something, I was putting my daddy to the test. And you see, <laughs> the Bible says, don't let us put Christ to the test. Christ doesn't want me to be hurt or harmed or destroyed. But if I keep tempting him, what I'm doing is I'm telling him, I don't really love you. I don't respect you. I got no respect for you. You know what the scripture says in, in just a few uh, verses up or back? It says in, in Corinthians, it says, therefore, let us go on from this point, perfecting holiness in body and spirit out of fear and reverence for God. Perfecting holiness. Now, I'm his child. He loves me. But he wants me to be a shining example of who he is. I'm the light of the world. If I go out and start living in sin, when I've claimed that I'm a Christian, what am I telling the world? I'm telling the world I got no respect at all for my heavenly father I don't care he don't care he's going to forgive me no matter what I do so let me just go do what I want there's another passage that Peter talks about over there that says you know he said they turn the grace of God into lasciviousness the license to sin they told Paul that's what he preached he said God forbid may you be judged for saying that these people came out from under the law it was tough to live under the law. Now they have freedom in Christ. Do you think that they thought that freedom was so they could run around and commit all the sins that they wanted to commit? No, the Bible says that it, Paul said, God forbid that you would even think that. You weren't set free to sin. You're set free to live like God, like a child of his. But you see, you've got to have a love for Christ. 
First of all, you got to know, number one, what you were saved from. And you got to know the love of the one who saved you and what he went through so that you could be saved and how deeply he loves you. And every time we go and we do this, we tempt Christ, we're inviting his wrath. We're not inviting anger. He will be angry. And you see, if you have a, you have a loving father, if I'm, as I'm growing as a Christian, I'm going to keep failing. God, he said, judge yourself. You wouldn't get judged. Basically, discipline. You're not going to get disciplined. If you're disciplining yourself, if you're correcting yourself, if you fall, you repent. He said, judge yourself so I don't have to. How many of you know all parents want to do that? Just do what is right. But if you just keep blatantly going out there and sinning in his face and throwing it in his face and telling him, you're basically telling him how much you disrespect him, how much you don't, don't love him, you could care less what he thinks. You're inviting judgment. Let's see what happens. He says, he said they were destroyed of serpents. Who, what's a serpent? Who's, who was a serpent? Satan. You see what happens, that serpent? He was injecting his venom. He was injecting his venom. And that venom was getting in their system. And that villain was killing them. And they were dying. And they cried out to the Lord and he said, told Moses, he said, make a golden serpent on a pole and raise it up. And when the people look upon it, they will be saved. See, even in their sin, they're being destroyed of the serpent, of the devil. They're being injected with all of his venom. The Lord said, he still sent away. Turn around. Look up. And look at that image and you'll be saved you'll be saved and it put the venom it destroyed the power of the venom and they were restored God always wants to restore he doesn't want to destroy he doesn't want you to destroy but there comes a point where we have to understand by giving in to the devil and practicing sin we are choosing that I cannot ask God to protect me if I'm doing everything the devil is telling me to do, I'm opening myself up to destruction. And that's what Paul's warning about here. He said, verse 10, nor complain as some of them who also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things have happened to them as examples and they were written as an admi admonition upon whom the ends of the age have come. Therefore let he who thinks he stands take heed, what? lest he fall. You see, King David committed a, a gruesome sin. Now, this wasn't a man who was ignorant of God. This wasn't a man who was ignorant of God. He was the king of Israel. He was put there because God had chosen him. He knew God intimately. The Lord said, I'll find me a man after my own heart. But that man went out and did something that probably none of us would ever think about doing, putting to death uh, our servant so I can have his wife because I was covering up for our adulterous affair. Now, when he did that and Nathan came and rebuked him, whew, that's fearful. And King David laid on his bed and wept day and night, the Bible says. He was so grieved and so sorrowful for what he had done for the evil of his sin. And he thought, Lord, please do not take thy Holy Spirit from me. This wasn't an ignorant man. He knew exactly what he was doing. And he did it against God. He said, against you, O Lord, and you alone have I sinned and done this great evil. He had done it against God. He said, and you alone. He said, burnt offering and sacrifice I would give you but I know you do not desire it, but only a broken and a contrite heart. A broken and a contrite heart, he said, you will not despise. He had to break and, and be humbled, tremendously humbled. And when he did, Nathan told him, he said, he said, uh, because of this, though, 
because of your sin, and this is what you have to have a reality of people in your life. God will forgive you, but there are lingering consequences for your sin. You don't get free from the consequences. You get free from the guilt. You get free from death. You get free from the sin. But the Lord told him, he said, from this day forward, your family saw all what you did. And from this day forward, you'll never have nothing but a sword in your house from this day forward. His kids started killing each other. <laughs> and then his son did exactly what he did. Went and, went and attacked him, made war against him, rebelled against him, and went up on the roof and, and had sexual relations with all of his, his wives. Where did he learn that from? His daddy. Sin has consequences. What did Jesus do for the woman who was caught in adultery? I see people sinning all the time and they want to quote stuff like, I'm like King David. I've heard ministers that were living in sin doing that. And then quote King David. No, the Bible says of David, from that day forward, David sinned no more. David sinned no more. There was no more. And then what does it say? What did Jesus say to the woman who's caught in adultery? Where's your accusers, woman? She said, there are none. He said, neither do I condemn thee. But he said, go and sin no more. That's a stern warning. Go and sin no more. Don't you do it again. You know, when he had healed people, and apparently he, Jesus knows everybody's life. He knows who they are. He knows what they've gone through. And in some of those situations, it was probably because of something they did in their life. They see, this isn't the case all the time. God uses uh, sickness in people's lives in different ways and problems in people's lives. The Bible says of Paul, he was given a messenger of Satan in his flesh. But there was a spiritual purpose for it. But it, to this one uh, number of people, he told them after he healed them, he said, go and sin no more. Notice what he said had caused their problem? Sin. Go and sin no more lest a more serious thing come on you. Lest a more serious thing come on you. This is where we don't understand the reality that the devil is out for de to destroy. Notice who these people were destroyed by? The serpent and the devil and the destroyer. What was he out to do? Destroy God's people. And this is what they were destroyed by. All right, let's move and let's finish up. So he says, if you, he said, therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you, such as common to man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond which you are able, but with the temptation he will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to, hear, to bear it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak to you as wise men, judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, we are all partakers of that one bread. He said the, these words, Otherwise Israel after the flesh, observe Israel after the flesh, are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What am I saying then, that an idol is, isn't anything or what is offered to an idol is anything. Rather that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to who? Demons and not to God. I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. Listen. Or do you provoke the Lord to jealousy? We are not stronger than he. We are not stronger than he. You cannot, how many of you believe, or how many of you know that when you go do things, that you are not, know that God is not in that, that you are participating with the devil? And listen to me, people. You're participating with demons. You're drinking the cup of the devil, and then you come to church and you want to drink from the blessing in the cup of the Lord. This is what he's warning them about. You can't go out there and sin in the world and drink from the same cup 
and eat of the same food that demons are drinking of and eating of. See, I'm not going to go out and fellowship in the world. I, love the, I, I don't love the world, but I love the people who are in the world. I want them to come to Christ. But I'm not going to go out there and people who are not Christians, they're of the devil, and they're fellowshipping with the devil. And I'm not going to go out there in my Christian life and begin to fellowship with the devil. I'm not going to go out there and participate with them in their revelings and their parties and everything else they're doing because they're not living for God. They're living for the devil, and they're participating with the devil. And if I'm a Christian, I cannot go out there and live with the devil, drink from his cup, you know, <laughs> eat of his food, and then come back in church and eat and drink of the cup of the Lord. He said, are you stronger than the Lord? Don't you understand that by living that way, you are provoking the Lord to jealousy? You're provoking the Lord to jealousy? And what does he say? Are you stronger than he is? You see, this is what we can't do. We can't be a partaker with Christ and a partaker with the devil. What fellowship, people, does Christ have with the devil? Is there any fellowship between Christ and the devil? Any communion? No. And you and I, as a Christian, we can't go out and live like the devil and, and partake of sin and live in sin and then come in here and take of the Lord's communion and say, I'm a Christian. The Bible says, judge yourself before you take this. Why does it say that? He said, because if you don't, if you're doing that, you will be bringing judgment on your own self. You will be bringing judgment on your own self. And why is that? He said, this is the reason, listen to what he said. He said that many of you are sickly and weak. And he said, many are dead. Many are dead. That's what he said. Because they do not judge themselves. Now, this is the message God put in my heart, and this is what I want you to hear. I have a communion. That communion you have should be the most important thing, is your communion with the Lord and fellowshipping with the Lord and walking with the Lord and communing with the Lord. Everything else is trivial compared to that. That communion you must protect. That relationship is something we must all protect. Now, that's not going to be hard if you're walking with the Lord and you're doing what God's called you to do and living like you should. It only gets tough when you open up your life to that bait that the devil wants you to have and, and always know that there's a reason for it. He's desiring to pull you away from communion with the Lord. And his end is the same way the Bible says that he gave us th them as examples, that we should not do what they do. We should not do what they did. We should not rise up early and, and rebel. We should not be playing the devil's games. We shouldn't be going out there living like the devil lives and being idolaters and fornicators. Idolater is somebody that puts something before the Lord, something else, whatever it is in your life that's more important to you than the Lord. That becomes your idol. And there's nothing in your communion that should come between you and the Lord. Amen? Amen, Amen Brother Sid. I'm going to let you have it, brother.